Red Cave Podcast. Reading tonight from Tales from the Cracks, numbers 25 through 27. Starting with Sunborn Black, followed by Bloody Mary, I Have Your Child. And concluded with Dreams of the Destroyer. When midnight mists are creeping, and all the land is sleeping, around me tread the mighty dead, and slowly pass away. Lo, warrior saints and sages, from out the vanished ages, with solemn pace and reverend face, appear and pass away. The blaze of noonday splendor, the twilight soft and tender, may charm the eye, yet they shall die, shall die and pass away. But here in dreamland center, no spoiler's hand may enter. These visions fair, this radiance rare, shall never pass away. I see the shadows falling, the forms of old recalling. Around me tread the mighty dead and slowly pass away. Lewis Carroll Sunborn Black When I was a child, perhaps four or five, I was having excessive nightmares. Horribly vivid dreams night after night, for a month at the least. And every night when I closed my heavy eyes, I had a dream. And every night in that nightmare I died. Not always the same way, but it was always before I died in my dreams that scared me the most. And it was always the same. I would get down on my knees before the lip of a sloping cliff, and I would throw my hands up to the sky, toward the sun that was always looking down on me. Then I would just die. Sometimes I would throw myself off the cliff, or sometimes I would just collapse there on the stiff rock and become lifeless. Other times I would turn away from the cliff and face an ocean of an unspeakable length and drown myself in it. Each night I would fall asleep in my bed, hoping to God that I wouldn't have that horrible nightmare. But I knew deep down that I would. I would even try to guess how I would perish. The cliff? The ocean? Or would I just collapse? I could never guess right, but it was always one of those three. I would then wake up, screaming and calling for my mother. The first week she'd run in and hug me, trying to comfort me until I'd fall asleep again. I'd never have the dream twice in one night, and I thought that as a blessing. Then one night I woke up from my nightmare and bawled out for my mom. She never came. I screamed and pleaded for her to come, but she never did. The fact was, I knew she heard me because her room was right next door. It was so close to her earshot. I crept over to her room and peered in through the open door. She was sleeping in her bed, or pretending I'm quite sure of now. The next morning she said she never heard my screams, and I knew she was lying. That night, I awoke from my nightmare and again screamed out for her. She never came, and I had to go back to sleep without her with me. You see, she was ignoring my cries to try and teach me that she wouldn't be there to comfort me back to sleep for the rest of my life. So night after night, I'd have the dream and I'd call out to her, knowing she wouldn't come to my aid no matter how much I cried. So that's when I just gave up, going back to sleep right after the dream until they suddenly just stopped. I don't know if that was the best way to teach a child a lesson, to ignore them until they worked out their problems themselves. It was tough love, in a sense. And that's how I feel now, my constant reader. I feel ignored. I feel like there's no one to help me or comfort me except for that cruel peering eye in the sky. I am alone, my reader, and I have now given up. But will my problems solve themselves like before, now that I've given up? I think not. Now let me start at the beginning. My name is Desmond Black, and I am stranded. I don't know when or if anyone will ever find the diary of my last day on Earth here on this wasteland, but I deserve to be heard in case someone does come along. If anything, I deserve that much. I was on a plane a little over a week ago with my girlfriend Amy and my friend Paul. He also had his girl along, Laura. We were headed for Europe. It was supposed to be our little vacation before our freshman year in college. We were going to visit France and Germany, you know, the whole shebang. We had been saving up for that trip for a year at the least. It was going to be great. It was going to be the place where I would propose to Amy. The plane took off for Paris, all of us shaking with excitement in our uncomfortable seats. My good friend Paul was patting me on the back the whole way, regaling me about the last time he had been in Europe and what we would have to do first. It wasn't an entirely full flight, but there were enough people to be missed. I know that for sure. They will certainly be missed. Halfway through the flight, turbulence rippled over our plane like waves of brutal force. Seat belts clicked and people looked worriedly about their surroundings. Others tried to play it cool like Paul, Laura, and Amy. I, on the other hand, was terrified. I glued my face to the small window, watching the cold night air outside. Below, I knew, was the angry Pacific Ocean, staring up at our toy plane like a hungry child. Then the plane shuddered so brutally that everyone bucked off their seats and into their seat belts. 
Now people were panicking, dinging their little call buttons and whirling around in their seats like lost animals. I for one hugged Amy, waiting for the pilot to click on and assure us it was only some slight turbulence. He never came on, but I do remember seeing a female flight attendant run to the back of the plane hysterically, running for her own safety seat. Another shudder sent her sailing to the rear of the plane. The plane's nose dipped and everyone started to scream, an alarm sounding from the pilot's cabin like a fire warning. The last memory I have is Amy clutching me tightly before the emergency exit to the plane tore open with a terrific rip. Seats with people still attached were uplifted into the night, like pieces of fluttering paper. Amy and I were taken as well, our grips around each other stripped apart. In the black night, as we fell, I recall seeing Amy drift quickly away from me, her fingers outstretched and mouth open in a silent scream. I glanced down below my vertical seat to see the reaching foamy waves below, then only black. I must have been rocked into unconsciousness because when I woke up, I was looking up into the blue sky. My plane seat had washed up on land, it seemed, resting on its back so that it was like I was lying on a bed. I shakily undid my seatbelt, noticing my blue, frozen fingers. I rolled off the seat and fell upon solid rock. I struck my head, bringing stars. I had washed up onto land, but not an island with a beach and a jungle. I was on a hulk of a black rock with a slanting cliff that circled one side of the island. The makeshift island itself was as big as a house's basement, surrounded on all sides by crystal blue water. There was no civilization to be seen anywhere. I sat up on the cold black rock, the waves crashing over my cross legs. There was another person on the island I could see perfectly parallel to me. I climbed to my feet and limped over to the figure on the very middle of the rock slope. I stopped, realizing that Paul was sitting there, tears rolling down his face and his hands hanging over his knees. He glanced up at me and forced a smile. He told me he wanted to let me sleep, but he had seen I was alive. His plane seat had also washed ashore, but over on the other side of the rock. He was in worse shape than me, though. There was a large gash in his scalp, and I could tell that his collarbone was snapped under his drenched shirt. So we spent the next few days searching for food or any wood to create a fire. We began to eat the moss on the rocks, and we only threw it up the first two times. The nights were so cold there on the stiff rock. Not that I was sleeping anyway. I cried at night, knowing Amy was dead out there somewhere, still strapped to her seat. I could tell Paul was doing the same. We would wake and not speak to each other much. Our stomachs were rumbling angrily, but no nourishment was on that rock at all. There was no wood either, so we couldn't build a fire. Not that we could start a fire. So we just sat there upon the black cliff, watching the waves below us twist and whirl. We both could hear each other's stomachs, but never came out and said we were hungry. We were strangers to each other, secretly letting out our emotions in nighttime to our black beds. On the third day, we were moaning in pain from our hunger and began to drink the ocean water to help. Yet we became deathly ill from it and spent the night dry heaving over the tall cliff. Once a seagull landed gaily on a crop of rocks, and in our madness we pounced on it, only for it to whisk away. We cried out in anger and in sorrow, cursing at the sun above us for not helping. I hate that sun, how it stares at you, sitting idly in the sky while you scream and cry out for its help. But it never answers or comes to aid, it just sits there. Again, I was getting that dose of tough love. I had to solve my own problems myself, so I did. The fourth night I woke to Paul's retching sobs there before the cliff. I decided to go sit by him and he hugged me tightly, crying into my chest. He was looking bad now. His gash had become infected and was clotting into a pussy scab. As he hugged me, I felt his broken shard of bone poke into me like an accusing finger. That night, I hugged a skeleton. We were that way for a long time, hugging and sobbing into each other's shoulders like real friends. No longer were we strangers, and that made my next action that much harder. I let him fall asleep there at my feet, but I stayed awake even as my ravaged body begged for rest. I had to feed that hunger inside me. I had to. So as he slept there at my bare feet, I hovered over him, my hand reaching for a large rock by the cliff edge. I tried to stop myself. I tried to find a reason, a way to convince myself I shouldn't, that he was my best friend. Good holy god, he was my only friend. I tried to tell myself that if I did this, I would be alone. I would die alone. But my hands had a mind of their own, and my stomach was working the controls. The rock came down on my friend's skull. Again and again it fell. He had cried out once, but only once. I dropped the rock over the cliff and put my nose inches from his cold, still face. I then smiled, and I can't say why. I had killed him, my only friend left in the world. That night, I spent the next few hours stripping his body bare and getting ready to feast. It was a feast set for a king, and I did enjoy it. I finished every bit of him through a span of three days. 
There was no way to cook it. It was raw down to every spotless bone in his body, but my stomach took every bite greedily. I don't regret what I did. Not at all. Maybe I am going mad. It sure feels like it. Here on the tenth day, on this dreadful rock, my stomach begins to growl again. Did I really think I could get away with it? Killing my friend and staying well-fed until the day I died? Yet, certainly, I did think that, and I cursed at my stomach. I cried for it to stop, but it kept pleading its hunger. I turned my attention to the sun that always bore down on me, cooking my exposed skin and laughing silently as I squirmed beneath its heavy glow. I screamed and cried for the sun to help me, to stop staring at me. It only watched with its hateful yellow eye, ignoring me from the other room, pretending to be asleep while I pleaded for my bed. Ah, tough love, does it ever end? So now I sit here writing my last testament on a notepad I always keep in my wallet. I write with a pen from Paul's tattered jeans. Will anyone get this? I don't know. But I know if they do, I won't be here. They may be shocked to learn what happened on this ghost of an island, but I don't care. No one can convict a dead man, not in this life. I will sit my diary here on the cliff I sit on, tucked under a rock and marked by the piece of Paul's shattered collarbone. So if anyone came by, they'd see the bone and search the area to come across the note I left. Ha! Do I do anything else but dream? Maybe it is finally time to wake up. So if the reader can believe it, I'm on my knees before the sloping cliff, hands thrown up to the sky towards the silent sun. I'm trying to reach for it, and if I can, I'll grab it and hold on to it. It'll comfort me back into sleep, and it won't let me go. Never an eternity. Even as I kneel here, I'm still guessing on where this next turn will take me. Not until I finally set this notebook down will I know. But I must say, the anticipation is killing me. Bloody Mary, I have your child. That crisp December 5th saw a slight turn in the weather. Icicles were melting and the snowmen were sinking. It was four o'clock in the afternoon, and kids were home from school, and parents were plopping down in their sofas and chairs. The police weren't relaxing, though, especially not Officer Robert Downs and Donald Lawrence. They had been to the Jacobs household the previous week to see about asking questions about the disturbance at Penny Lane with the vandalized fence. The father, Mr. Jacobs, informed the officers that Mary and Caitlin Jacobs had been asleep the whole time, the two police thanked the man for his time and continued on their way. The next morning they returned to the blue log circle off of Penny Lane and took another look at what was left behind in Miss Delore's front and back lawns. Robert Downs dragged his foot through the fresh snow of last night. He paused. The sleeve of a jacket was sticking out of the white powder. He considered it for a moment as he carefully lifted it out of the snow. It was a heavy ski jacket. He brushed it softly and inspected his find. Don, come here for a sec, he said to his partner. Take a look at this. He handed Don the jacket and he looked at it with interest. There's a rip in this jacket, almost as if it's been stabbed, Robert finished. So what does this mean? Donald asked, holding the jacket outwards. Robert did not answer. Donald turned the coat over and looked into the inner lining. On the tag was scribbled, Mary Jacobs. Don's mouth fell open and he pointed this out to Robert. Rob took it and held it out in front of him. He peered down the street where he could just see the Jacobs house inside the cul-de-sac. Well, let's get our facts straight, said Robert. Not long after this, the two policemen were on the porch of the house. No answer. The family was away. When the two men were about to turn away, the front door opened. They stood there for a few seconds waiting for someone to come out from behind the door and greet them, but no one did. Hello? Rob asked. He stepped forward, pushing the door open a bit more. The inside of the house was revealed, empty and silent. Rob put his hand to his gun and gave Donald a look of alert caution. Donald nodded, his hand at his own hip. Robert stepped inside the house, his gun loosely held out in front of him. Donald followed. Is anyone here? Ronald asked. He knew no one was, though. But how could the front door just swing open like that? Rob took a look at the door and saw that it had been unlocked. Usually when people leave, they lock the front door. Sometimes owners forget, but Rob tried to think if he had heard the lock click before the door opened. Had he? He could have. His hearing wasn't as reliable as it used to be. Don, I'm not liking the look of this, Robert whispered over at him. Don gulped and carefully cocked his handgun. Any sign of foul play? He asked. Robert looked around the house quickly. No, he said simply. Then a cry of pure pain broke through the silence. It was the voice of a woman. It was the cry of despair and anguish. This person sounded as if she had been wounded, and it came from directly under their feet. The basement. The cry came again, followed by something that sounded like a piece of furniture toppling over. The cops sprinted forward, searching every door they came to. They found the basement door in a matter of seconds and were bounding down the stairs. Robert yelled for the woman. 
Don screamed for anyone else to put their hands up. Ma'am, are you okay? Hands above your head! Once they had entered the cold basement, they saw nothing but old boxes and one unused treadmill. There was no distressed woman or anything of that nature. There was, though, not more than a few yards away, an old trunk which looked like it belonged to a circus years ago to carry costumes and props. It was turned on its side and looked like it had rolled a few feet forwards. That must have been the large bang they had heard from upstairs. That's a huge chest, Don exclaimed. He lowered his gun. Robert snapped his head around, but did not see any sign of anybody. He did not lower his gun, though. He strode over to the trunk and prodded it with the toe of his shoe. The trunk was big enough to hold a person. Maybe that was the source of the disturbance. Can anyone hear me? Robert asked. Robert, you think there's someone in there? Don asked, astonished. That's exactly what I'm thinking. He kicked the trunk harder this time. That's when it rocked upwards and slammed Rob in the shins. He screamed out and fell on his back, the gun bouncing away. Donald sprang forward to help Robert, but the trunk twirled around like a top. The corner of its base caught Don in the back side of his thigh. He lost his footing and did the splits right there on the concrete. His knee smashed into it, and the muscle in his groin twisted into a knot. The trunk rear-ended Robert in the lower body before it bounded backwards again. Robert screamed again, reaching out for his partner. Donald got onto his hands and knees and had time to see what looked like a hand shoot out from the trunk's interior. But this hand did not break through. It went through it. It was translucent, too, and blurry. Another hand came into view, and what Donald thought was the beginnings of a head. It was hard to make out, but he could see two glazed eyes. No mouth, but there was more blood running down the lucid features. Rubber got to his feet and hobbled over towards Don's resting place. Donald looked up, stunned. His hands compressed against his sore leg. His eyes were glued to the ghostly figure that was emerging from the trunk. Robert grabbed Donald by his arm and pulled him up against the solid concrete wall. The figure was now up out of the trunk and was standing next to it. Rob looked back at a woman, who hovered above the ground, with no legs, no real clothing, but he could see her arms held out at her sides. The one thing that looked unmistakable and solid was a scepter of some kind, held in one of her hands. It was sculpted from gold to look like a serpent, with jewels and diamonds encrusted on the outside. She just stood there for a few seconds before, out of the open serpent's mouth, a long, double-edged blade slid, which was already blood-stained and rusted. The thing laughed wickedly. Robert moved fast and snatched Don's gun from the ground. He knew that it was no good, but he fired once through the figure, making dust of the back wall. Robert was hysterical now. He was about to fire again, but the woman appeared at Rob's feet and detached his hands from his arms in one long sweep. Robert screamed and was thrust backwards into Donald, sending them both into a dusty heap on the ground. Blood covered them both as the ghost woman loomed over them, her cold eyes laughing and mocking. She struck and sank the blade into Robert's chest, killing him instantly. Donald screeched and pushed his partner off of him. He quickly got to his feet and darted up the stairs with much effort. He could hear a woman cry out with glee and the tread of footsteps on the steps behind him. Don screamed as he stumbled forwards onto his chest and knees. Behind him, hard laughter followed his temporarily grounded body. He scrambled up the steps. He was panting desperately, his hands reaching out at the stairs. His arm muscles helped to pull up his dead weight towards the open doorway ahead. Donald's fingers were right at the landing of the upstairs when a cold hand came through his uniform and dug into the top of his back. He howled in pain as the hand recoiled, pulling Donald backwards. He twirled his arms around in circles trying to catch his balance, but he was gone. He tumbled back down the splintered steps, his head cracking into the wall, shoulders separating under impact, and his arm and one of his wrists snapped like twigs. On his way down, he fell through the woman, and before he died, he felt ice-cold life and death crawl into his veins and organs. Propped up against the last stair, and the bottom landing was the scepter, its blade setting perpendicular for Donald. He had enough time to see it sitting there, the snake's eyes laughing and egging him on. He stuck out his elbows and kicked off at the stairs. He soared over the last few steps, but as he landed next to the dead Robert at the bottom, in a puddle of blood, his foot caught the handle of the cane and it twirled upwards into the air. Donald groaned, his head trying to raise upwards. His whole world was spinning now and he could see a blue wisp of a woman standing in the stairwell, cold dead eyes staring directly at Don's twisted, aching body. His head fell back onto the concrete. That's when he saw the falling cane impale into his hip. He screamed again, closing his eyes tight. Tears rolled down his chubby cheeks. When he opened his eyes again, the woman's featureless face was millimeters away. All he could see were her blank eyes, full of pain and hate. 
They seemed to scream out at him, cursing and mocking him. All of these mixed emotions rang inside his head after staring into those eyes. He spasmed forcefully with a serious heart attack. He twisted into a frozen knot, his eyes glassy and perplexed. His mouth was sculpted in mid-scream, his arms out in front of him, fingers gnarled. The woman simply evaporated into the air. Mrs. Norris peered outside her window around 5 o'clock to see a police car moving slowly down the road. Inside, a policeman, whose mouth and eyes were open widely, glared out of the window with a pained expression. He did not blink or move. It was like he was frozen. In the driver's seat, there was an officer who was hunched forward, his eyes closed, and his hands missing from the wheel. This was very odd, but the car was driving, so there couldn't be too much wrong. Maybe he was searching blindly for something on the ground. He'd get his hands back on the wheel soon. She went away from the window, and she did not see the police car ride smoothly off the small, cracked road and onto the lake beach. It rode smoothly across the sand, past houses' backyards, until it slowly drove into the lake. It treaded water until it was about ten yards out. It sank downwards in a small spray of foam, leaving only a few bubbles to decorate the water's surface. If Mrs. Norris had checked the lake, she would have seen the Buick sitting at the bottom, quickly gathering rust. Inside, two dead bodies hovered loosely above their seats. One would have missing hands. If Mrs. Norris had looked out of her window again, she would have seen a blurry sequent woman emerge slowly out of the water. Once on the beach, she would just fade away, taking the tire treads in the sand with her. But she left her footprints behind, which one neighbor noticed and pondered over. They were from the lake and seemed to vanish. She didn't seem to think much about it. From the school to Mary's house was a total of 17 minutes, so the bike ride wasn't very comfortable. Due to the amount of seating each person had, Mary shuddered when she looked up at her house because it was like looking at the face of an ugly mask. Come on, Mary said, getting off the bike and proceeding into the house. Will and her sister Katie followed, both confused and scared. Katie at least knew what Mary was planning to do, but Will was left in the dark about the whole thing. Mary strode up the stairs, headed straight toward the open door of her bedroom. Will followed close behind, Katie in the rear. Mary took a deep cleansing breath and poked her head inside the room. She gasped and pulled back out into the hall beside her boyfriend. It's back on the wall, even after I locked it up, Mary whispered to Katie. At that, Katie began to shake. Get the hammer, I left it in the basement, by the trunk. Katie nodded and took off down the stairs. Will looked over into Mary's face. What's on your wall? Will asked. Are you talking about that creepy trunk in your basement? Did your family finally get it open? Mary didn't answer. She proceeded back into her room and noticed how freezing cold it was. A huge plume of her breath burst out in front of her. She covered her arms and sat down on her bed, facing the horrid mirror. It's freezing in here, Will pointed out as he stepped inside the room. Katie stepped inside after him. The hammer held out like a baton. She also commented on the room's temperature before handing the hammer over to her sister. Mary lifted the hammer and stepped toward the mirror slowly. Mary, what are you- She moaned as the mirror fogged over as if ten people had just breathed on the surface all at once, which caused Will and Katie to cower by the door. The mirror then started to hum and vibrate. On the glass, the darkness broke apart and revealed Will's reflection standing there in Mary's room, staring distantly at Mary. The mirror version of Will suddenly screamed as a long, rusty blade came into view and sliced down his forehead to his neck. He screeched as blood flew every which way, one of his eyes popping out of his socket. Blood now was starting to spray at the glass, splattering Mary's carpet and jeans. She screamed hoarsely, wiping blood away from her, but it only existed in the mirror. Will slid down the wall, leaving a streak of fresh blood. Now Katie came into frame. The same blades stabbed at her and caught her between the shoulder blades and reeled her backward. A blue hand reached out and grabbed her by the hair. The blade then came down in a shower of blood. Mary shook off the distractions. She got to her feet and raised the hammer. By the time the tool was descending towards the glass, her sister was flailing around on the floor, the blade stabbing into her stomach inside the mirror. Mary screamed her tonsils out as the hammer hit the glass and spread a large spiderweb crack across it. Off in the distance, they could hear a woman screaming out in pain. She brought the hammer back down into the mirror, breaking it off of the wall. She got down onto her hands and knees and made sure all of the large pieces had been reduced to gravel. The woman had stopped screaming, and by the time Mary brought the hammer down again for the final time, they sat in silence. She dropped the tool and fell back onto her bed, tears rolling down her cheeks. Then Will flipped the light switch, 
and that's when everything came into perspective. The shards of glass were still there, and they noticed the large hole in the wall for the first time. The next day, after school, Mary did just as Miranda planned. She stayed behind to make up for a test she had missed, while Miranda and a couple of her friends broke away from the gym to roam the empty halls. Miranda circled around the history class, several times, her hawk eyes plastered on the classroom door. You remember your job, don't you? Miranda asked her blonde friend. I remember. Miranda smirked. She circled some more around the closed history room like a vulture as her friend prepped herself. The door swung open and Mary strode out. Katie had walked home so Mary could use her car. She pulled her keys from her tight jeans and proceeded down the hall. Outside it began to snow hard, which made Mary smile even more. She loved the snow because it only meant the holidays were closing in. From one of the classroom pods to Mary's right came the cheerleader blonde. She held a glass of red fruit punch in her hand. Mary didn't see the girl rush at her from the side and collide into her. The bright red punch catapulted at Mary's temple and soaked her face and hair in a sticky substance. Mary screeched and dropped her book bag. The blonde gave a sarcastic sorry and pulled back into the pod where her friends awaited her. You're kidding me, Mary blurted, watching the cheerleader go. She shook off the liquid and started towards the restroom to clean herself off. When Mary disappeared behind the girl's room door, Miranda came out from her hiding place, ready to do her damage. Mary cupped her hands under the icy cooled water in the sink and did her best to cleanse the sticky mess off of her. She dried her face and tried to fix her hair, but soon gave up. She'd be heading home soon, so what did it matter? Miranda came in after her. Her thumbs twiddled at the end of her short cheerleader skirt. She whined helplessly, tossing back her hair with a click of her neck. Mary turned towards her and automatically gathered up her stuff, trying for the door. Mary, please! Miranda whined again, backing up against the restroom door. What do you want, Miranda? Mary prodded. I have to talk to you. You know about Bloody Mary. Well, I did the chant thing last night and- Ha ha, Miranda, I get it, Mary said smugly. I'm afraid of ghosts, right? Mary tried one last time to push toward the door. No, I don't joke this time. I did the chant. I saw her in the mirror and I ran. Miranda started to fake cry, banging her forehead with her palms. You're kidding. I don't know why I did it. I was just skeptical about the whole thing. I did it as a joke, but but I know you you were afraid of her, so I... Come on, Mary huffed. All I did was say Bloody Mary 1, Bloody Mary 2, Miranda began. Bloody Mary 3... Bloody Mary 4? Okay, Miranda, I know how it goes. Miranda slid the doorstop into the door jam with the side of her sneaker. The other hand reached for the light switch behind her. Bloody Mary 5, Bloody Mary 6, Bloody Mary 7. Mary wrenched away from her and looked into her own reflection in the restroom mirror, then back at Miranda, who was grinning ear to ear. She was no longer crying when she switched the lights off. Bloody Mary 8. Miranda, this isn't funny, Mary moaned, reaching around the sinks. You don't know what you're doing. Bloody Mary 9. Don't! Mary stumbled toward Miranda's outline in front of her, but caught her foot around the backpack strap. She fell forwards into the sink, but was able to catch herself. Miranda! Bloody Mary 10! Miranda cackled. Bloody Mary, I have your child! Mary screamed. Miranda gracefully circled around Mary until she was standing right next to the sink. You baby! Miranda threw back her head and laughed. So where is she, huh? Mary scrambled forwards and ran through the darkness, forgetting her stuff. She struck the door with her shoulder and turned the knob, but it was locked. How? Mary's foot kicked at the bottom of the door and found there was a doorstop wedged in the jam. Mary fell to her knees and tried to unjam the doorstop. That's when Mary heard the distinct sound of cracking glass over her shoulders. Miranda stopped laughing, but Mary continued to try to dig the doorstop out from the crack. What was that, Jacobs? Miranda asked desperately. They heard dripping from the mirror, then running liquid, coursing down the wall-length mirror. It soon sounded like a fountain was in the room. Miranda screamed out in surprise as the dripping grew and grew until it sounded like they were in a waterfall. It started to cover the floor and Mary could feel it pooling around her knees. Mary tried to dig the door stop out, but her arm muscles felt knotted up and her sweaty fingers slipped off the rubber item. She then started to cry along with Miranda. What is this? What are you doing, Jacobs? She moaned. The rushing water stopped. Silence consumed the two girls until something was wading through the liquid, stepping towards them from one of the stalls. Mary heard the stall door swing open and clack into the wall. Footsteps came closer and closer. Is that you, Jacobs? Miranda whispered in stone-cold fear. No. Then Miranda screamed out for half a second before something sliced through the air and something else that sounded like ten pounds of meat clopped into the water. Mary spun around and almost fainted at what she saw. A blue woman held Miranda up into the air by her neck. Miranda thrashed around, but her mouth was stifled by the enormous amount of blood, so she couldn't scream. 
Her arm was laying next to the ghost woman's foot. Mary tried to shut her eyes, but couldn't. This was the first time she had seen Bloody Mary up close and personal. The woman had cold fishbowl eyes with milky white pupils. Her face was purple and pussy, her caterpillar lips pulled back to show yellow rotting teeth. The cobra scepter Mary had seen in the mirror was sticking into the tiled floor. Miranda was thrown backwards into the bloody mirror, smashing it to thousands of glass shards, which scattered around Mary's huddled body. Bloody Mary once again picked up Miranda and set her neatly atop the sink. The scepter appeared in her hand. Her other bloated palm struck Miranda across the cheek, instantly waking the girl. Miranda choked, and even through the dark, Mary could see her look over at her with pleading eyes and a quivering lip. This only made the ghost woman smile even whiter, as the bladed scepter connected with Miranda's gut. Mary tried to scream, but could only fall back into the door behind her, eyes glued to the glowing ghost, no more than ten feet away. With the blade inside Miranda, Bloody Mary lifted the rag doll body up over her head and slung her backwards into the open stall. Inside, Mary heard the porcelain toilet reduced to rubble and the spray of fresh water. Mary turned back to her work and wrenched the doorstop out from the jam with the remainder of her strength. She tossed it over her shoulder and turned for a moment so that she could get to her feet. She screamed because Bloody Mary's face was inches from her own. The decaying nose hissed like a squeaky squeeze toy as the ghost breathed. The rotten, rancid mouth was open before Mary. The pink tongue lifeless and useless. Her eye lolled back and forth as the other was rooted inside its socket. Blood ran down from it like tears. In a distant voice, which didn't seem to come from the moving mouth, Bloody Mary spoke to Mary. I'll see you at home, Bloody Mary said simply. Mary wasn't going to wait for another second. She plowed through the door and through the empty halls. She sprinted through the fresh snow and fumbled with her keys. Once inside her car, she fell over the steering wheel and sobbed, her heart beating alarmingly fast. A soaking wet Mary tripped inside her house, her heart still beating, her hands shaking. She knew what the ghostly apparition had meant. She leapt up the stairs three at a time as the family came through the kitchen to welcome her. Had she really thought it was over? Mary stepped inside her bedroom and her breath plumed out in front of her. She gasped because there on her wall hung Bloody Mary's mirror, perfectly new and clean. She could see bloody footprints on the carpet leading back to Mary's bed from the mirror. On the bed was Mary's book bag which she had left behind in the girls room back at school. It was zipped up and nicely buckled. Katie followed Mary and stepped up next to her. She too gasped when she saw that the mirror was back. Mary? The mirror? Katie began. No. It's not just a mirror, Mary whispered. Girls, is everything okay? Mr. Jacobs called from the bottom of the stairs. The girls didn't answer. Dreams of the Destroyer I walk through a forest of gnarly trees in the middle of the night. I ducked under branches and squeezed through pockets of thistles like I knew where I was going. It was as if I had no control, actually being steered by something. I thought I was being taken to a familiar spot that I knew of, but I was deposited onto a dark path with alien forms moving around in the darkness in front of me. I hesitated as a disembodied male voice explained that this was the mystery and I would have to enter it, it being the darkness. I remembered that I had a keychain flashlight on my keyring and used it to light the way, although it did very little in penetrating the dark. A strange elk creature stood off to the side of the path as I walked by. It was extremely frightening with its large and gnarly antlers and glowing eyes. It did not move as I passed, but pulled away from me into the thistles. Further up was a dark woman dressed in black who had her face hidden from me, possibly by a veil. She was to lead me from here on out. She led me up the path a little ways and up to a dusty shack, indicating that I should open the door. Strangely, I felt like I'd been there before. I proceeded into a spacious central room, which ended at a balcony. I looked over the railing and watched as the floor dropped like an elevator. When it stopped, I looked up at hundreds and hundreds of floors stretching up the side of the building like the inside of a really nice hotel. On each floor, nicely dressed men and women marched on with briefcases and bundles of paper. It was pure chaos, and these office workers were now on my floor, filing past me. Even though the woman had not followed me into the shack, I felt like I was still being led by something, and I didn't think enough to break that control. I followed the railing to a set of rickety stairs, and on the top landing I passed by the same creepy old woman in the veil, who had somehow gotten ahead of me. 
She indicated another door to me, directly up the last set of stairs, and I pushed through it without thinking. I entered a quiet suburban neighborhood, now in the middle of the day. It must have been Halloween because people were walking by in costumes. The town had a movie set feeling. After I performed a 360 degree turn, the horizon seemed way too close to my eyeline, as if the entire town was built on a platform floating in the air. I followed a marching line of people to a dead stop. The little man standing in line ahead of me turned his head to the side to stare back at me silently. Your name? I asked him. The man continued to stare. Well, you have to have a name. Fine, I'll give you one. You're Ronnie. I'm Ronnie, he said. That's right. I don't expect you to have much to say, so just listen. I need someone to talk to. Reasonable. I paused at a new sound in the background. Besides the static chatter of the hundred people crowded around us, there was also the obvious sound of music, distant and echoed. Do you hear that? The man did not react. There's a carnival somewhere. A carnival? What the hell are you talking about? We're in line for a roller coaster, I think. It's called the Goliath. The Goliath? A roller coaster? Don't you know? No, I don't know. I don't know how I got here. I fucking hate roller coasters. They scare the hell out of me. Why? I'm always afraid they'll break down or something. The music started to get louder. It was now clear that a male was singing. There was also drums, guitar. I'm totally hearing something. So? So? You don't find the music a little weird? Where's it coming from? Ronnie shrugged. What is this town? I asked him. This place? The only thing fun around here is the Goliath. This place is run by an evil king. We don't really talk about him much here. Why would he keep us here? He needs us to ride his ride, Ronnie said. Or else this place would be empty. He needs our compliance, our attention, our... Our fear, I asked. Ronnie shrugged, but ultimately nodded his head. I don't know if I believe this place is real, or you. I'm Ronnie. Yes, yes, you're Ronnie. But judging by the music, it's an alarm clock playing somewhere. Every morning I wake up to the radio, this is a dream. Ronnie laughed, and every person in line, back and front, turned to look at me. All chatter had stopped. It was dead silent except for the distant rock and roll music blaring. I looked around uneasily. Sorry, my mistake. Everyone went back to their business and the non-stop background noise of voices resumed. I need to wake up now. I don't know why I haven't woken up. The line moved on. All characters stepped forward in sync like soldiers in profile. Here, I'll prove to you I'm asleep, I whispered to Ronnie. I turned around and pointed at a tall, gaunt woman holding a purse. You, do five jumping jacks now. The woman dropped her purse and started to move. We watched her complete the five jumping jacks. See, I can make any of these people do anything. Do you think you can make me do anything? Ronnie challenged. I pushed past Ronnie and tapped another guy on the shoulder. The person turned around and I gasped. Where have you been? Dad? You can't go around stepping on toes. Discipline, son. I didn't raise you this way. Strangers talk with strangers, running like a chicken with his head cut off. Dad, I... The line moved again, and my dad stepped away without another word. I stood still, staring into space. Ronnie returned to his rightful place in line. He seems nice. He wasn't. Dead? I really need to wake up. Now! I closed my eyes and grimaced. I stamped my feet and slapped myself in the face. I told you the king won't let you leave, Ronnie said. Not until you ride his ride. You don't know anything. You can't know anything I don't know. You're part of my dream. Five ninety nine per pound. Offer expires January. Listen to yourself. You're a fucking radio commercial. I'm only trying to help. Help me get out of here. This is a dream, right? I should be able to change my background. I could fly if I wanted to. I'd like to see that. All I care about is waking up. That should be the simplest thing in the world. You hate roller coasters, right? The free fall should shock you enough to get you up. No, I've had this dream before. I never get on the ride. I'm the next one to get into the roller coaster car. I freeze and run away. Sometimes down the track and I'm run over. That's when I wake up. That has to hurt. Maybe this time if I actually ride it. Why do I keep dreaming of roller coasters? Face your fear? Nah, it's more than that. What are roller coasters? Exhilarating? Intense? Fast? Ronnie listed. That's it. They're brief. So very brief. 12 seconds. Fun? Yes. Scary? Yes. But fast? No doubt, I said. The line moved again. But you're afraid they'll stall and you'll get stuck, Ronnie interjected. Upside down. Upside down, yes. I like the idea of roller coasters, the ups and downs. Life. Life, sure. But I don't like the idea of interruption, of failure, a thing that dangerous. 
where so many things go wrong, it's not worth the chase. In fact, it's unnatural. Unnatural? Yes, like this world. Like the platform. Like this king you keep talking about. The Destroyer. The Destroyer? That's what he calls himself. The roller coaster goes to him every time. Goes right into his mouth. What do you- Ronnie screwed up his face, thinking. The roller coaster track goes right into his mouth, and it never comes back. So you've never ridden this ride before? No, I've never got to the front of the line. What will happen when I get there? You don't know unless you try. That's what my dad always said, that day in line for the Goliath. I freaked out and he tried to convince me that it was safe, that it wouldn't break down. He told me to trust him. But you ran? My dad was so unhappy. I don't know. His word wasn't enough for me. Trust is hard, Ronnie said. But it was my father. If you can't trust your own father, who can you trust? You can trust the Destroyer. The line moved again. And no, he's not dead. You spoke of him as if he was. Screw this. I pushed past him and every person scattered out of line to reveal the roller coaster car at the end. My dad was standing next to it, with one foot inside. I came up next to him. It's safe, I promise you. The track proceeded at a 60 degree incline straight up into the air, into the clouds. Maybe I'll check online to see if there's a video of the roller coaster first, I said, taking out my phone. My dad waited patiently in the roller coaster car, pulling the chest guard down tight across his stomach and watching me expectantly. I began scrolling through pictures on my screen, searching for footage of the Goliath. I paused on one picture of three trees standing before a lake. With my fingers on the screen, I zoomed in on the trees. I found that I could actually zoom past and see what was beyond the trees. This was surprising to me, especially because the things in the background were still high resolution, no matter how far I went. I got excited by this and seemed to enter the picture, moving over the lake at an intense speed. I could see the track below me now and knew that I had entered the Goliath. There was no going back, so I held on to the handles on my chest guard. I wanted to see how far into the picture I could really go. As I sped over the top of the lake, I questioned whether I was still in a dream. I seemed to tell myself no. I had been awake only a second ago, and this could only be my sleepy thoughts right before falling asleep. I dismissed the thought, skating over pieces of land and more bodies of water, as if this was a swamp of some kind. Then I moved over the hills in a mountainous region. Down below I watched a man resembling my father step out of the rundown shack I had approached before, looking up at me as I flew away. Then I entered one of the mountains, zooming through tunnels of stone. It was like a catacomb with many possible paths. I passed one branch that had a white light at the end of it, but it was so long. I continued on and came to the end of my current tunnel. It ended in a hole in the floor. Below me I could see a cluster of rocks, as if in a desert. I sped down into it at a reckless speed, passing right through wooden obstacles and supports that someone had set up in my way. A voice told me from somewhere that this was the Forbidden Way. The same male voice from the path, the one who told me about the mystery. I came to the end of the tunnel into the light, and then looked back. I was now floating in outer space. I had a good view slash sense of my body, weightless in this vacuum. The tunnel I had just exited was a plastic-looking tube attached to a larger machine suspended in space. It looked like a space station of some kind, with thousands of these tube-like appendages attached to it from all sides. I became aware that they were all different worlds, and I had just escaped the machine. The Destroyer. I knew that this was the farthest extent of my reality and I was free out there. I drifted further from the machine, but I could not balance myself. I felt topsy-turvy, not knowing what was up or down. There was a kind of ripping discomfort at my center, as if I was being pulled in several different directions. The male voice continued to speak to me. I saw that it was coming from an old-school radio slash video screen floating right next to me. It had robotic hands with white cartoonish gloves. I centered myself by taking the robot's hand, steadying my position. The robot's screen told me that I should return to the machine. I hadn't been listening and asked him to explain what he meant. We were drifting back to the tunnel I had just flown out of. I was aware of a greenish-slash-pink light that was emanating from sections of space right behind and ahead of me, surrounding the machine like a halo. The robot explained that I should respect the machine. Everything could be destroyed, but not the destroyer. I stopped before the top of the tube I had just come out of, ridged and painted hot pink. I crouched there and held on. I processed what the robot had told me. The voice prodded me to proceed back into the tunnel. Instead, I caught sight of another tube, open at the base of the machine. 
and releasing cascades of water into the void in sequent streams like a waterfall. Same commanding radio voice screamed at me to stop as I attached the end of the water hose to the tube I had exited, filling the machine with water, creating a feedback loop to short the system and free all those lost souls in that Halloween town, slaving away in that abandoned shack, or waiting in line for a roller coaster they'd never get to ride, but only once. The mechanical voice screamed and then gargled water. Before falling silent, I laughed with glee as the tentacles twisted and convulsed, as water sprayed from its seams and smoke poured out of its chimneys. I laughed until I cried, closing my eyes as the machine drifted away from me, sinking down into space, pulled by an unseen gravitational force into the black hole it had been spawned out of and I heard the rattle of a roller coaster, and the voices of innumerable people as they shouted with glee, finally free, and coming back around, the final bend. Tune in next time for Tales from the Cracks number 28 through 32. Starting with Why Not Robots, and followed by Death Doesn't Take a Break, Cell Sleeper, the pyrotechnic, and concluded with Crimson Creek. Until then, guard your soul.